Welcome to the IoT Powering the Digital Economy, Harnessing Progress, CNBC Debate. Thank you very much indeed. It's an absolutely awesome event, awesome crowd here as well. A warm welcome to CNBC's Internet of Things, Powering the Digital Economy uh, Debate. What is it all about? It's about digitalization, it's about Internet of Things, it's about here and now. Um, I've done lots of these type events as well, and we're always looking to the future in these events, I find, whether it's about energy, whether it's about the Internet of Things, whether it's about trade policy. I'm interested in the here and now, the state of progress here and now. So, three key areas we're going to cover today. One, what problems do companies have with aging infrastructure? Uh, what about managing energy, energy demand, managing energy itself, the speed of change? What tools are there here and now? What IoT tools are there that can help companies adapt and update? And then the third part of this debate is going to be about the implementation. There are barriers to implementation. You all know what they are. You all, for a living, spend your time getting over those barriers to implementation. So that's what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about as well. So I've got a great panel for you. We're going to come to that panel in approximately 10 minutes' time. But before that, I'd like to invite to the stage the CEO, our host here in Paris, uh, of uh, the uh, event, the CEO of Schneider Electric, Jean-Pascal Tricois, is going to join us. Uh, and hopefully, between us, we are going to set the scene for a stimulating hour. Hello. I put us so far away, I don't think we're going to start fighting, but anyway, I'll That's try. That's what I call it face to face, <laughs> right? Face to face. It's not quite as intimate, is it? Just me and you here as well. Look, I mentioned other debates I've done, uh, and one of the ones I did was with you uh, and, and, and a terrific panel, including Akon. I can't promise you an Akon today, but I can promise you a very good panel. I don't know if Morris Levy can sing, but uh, we'll come to that in a few moments' time. But it was a great debate that we had in Davos, and it was about digitalization. It was about the appetite for it. I want to move that on. How do we get here and now to a stage where people are more able to implement the product? And what are the problems now? And how does it fit in with everything else that's going in the rest of the world? Because it's easy to get stuck in the Internet of Things bubble when you're at an event like this. But obviously, you have to put that in with it. There's trade wars. There's geopolitics. There's other issues. There are flows of economic growth and recession, what have you. So, this is your mantra. This is what you're trying to push. But it has to fit in with everything else as well. So, where are we at? You did the question and the answer, right? <laughs> no, the, the, well, I, I think first we shouldn't make it that dramatic. Actually, digitization is really happening. And it's happening everywhere. I, I look at my week, the past week. I was in China two weekends ago, um, spending the whole weekend about manufacturing in China 2025. So look at China, qualified before as manual, low-cost assembly, moving massively to digital, high-quality, high-traceability, high-innovation kind of manufacturing. Moved on to Singapore, opened an equal quarter with a green building. Mm -hmm. Moved on to the US, again, industrial internet, so industry applying the digital technologies. Landed in France two days ago on, on re-inaugurated a factory of Schneider that used to be very automated, but now leveraging fully the digital technology to go to the next step. So forget about digital, maybe tomorrow on things, it's happening. And if you are not digital tomorrow, it's going to be very difficult to be competitive in industry and in the buildings you produce, right? Because building that you are building is here for the next 10, 50 years, and it needs to be green, smart, and, and automated. So things are happening. Take our company. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 10% of what we are selling was, connect, was connected. Mm -hmm. Today, 50%. So it's a gigantic growth of all the elements, the connected products, the controls on spot, uh, the software, the analytics, the digital services. Now there are still barriers. Um, and the barrier is conservatism. We just all have those technologies available. Technologies are really available. And they are really cheap respect to what they were a long time ago, and even a short time ago. So uh, the capacity to use technology is changing all the day. Have we changed fundamentally the way we design buildings? Have we changed fundamentally the way we rethink industries? Have we changed the way we think about efficiency? Not at all. Most of the schools for those technologies don't exist yet. Most of the people are not tool or trained for it. People are still quite conservative in the way they think and rethink things. But frankly, when you look at the possibilities, there are already enormous possibilities to get to much higher level of efficiency, reliability, safety, all those things, comfort, today with what is happening. But it's for us to embrace a new thinking and to train the people. 
I don't know if it was a Schneider statistic, but I came across this in, in my briefing pack as well. 48% of companies have no plan for energy and CO2 management. How can that be that half of the companies out there don't even have a plan at the moment? Well, that's actually changing also quite fast. Um, what you see is that some companies don't have any plan. Frankly, when I go around the world, maybe because we belong to the same crowd and we believe in efficiency and reduction of emissions, I may be meeting people who resemble us, uh, but all the people I meet have a plan now. Mm -hmm. Do they have a, an holistic roadmap to make it happen? Not so much. So very often there are good intentions, very often using existing and proven ways to do it, but is there a complete plan for the whole evolution? Is there the technology roadmap to make it happen? Uh, not always. And this is where I believe first in coalition of companies. For instance, we belong to the Renewable 100, so the companies which are committed to be fully supplied in renewable in a very short term. Same thing for energy productivity. We keep working on our productivity. And when you are in those circles, you exchange experience, uh, you learn from the other ones, and you put together, you compare notes, and you put together, together a plan. But this is where we have a role to play as Schneider. I mean, we have specialist architects of industries that can come sit together with the customers. Uh, we are a big industrial company. Uh, we have 200 factories ourselves, so we know what it is to be an industrial. We are not theoreticians of it. Uh, so sitting together, comparing notes, and putting together the plan of evolution. People have a lot of misconception. Efficiency, thanks to digitization, disrupts completely the return on investment on efficiency. I wonder if you and I are part of the same echo chamber. Bearing in mind, I'm just going through all the different events that I've been at that you've been at as well over the last few years. And one of the events was in this city, and it was at Le Bourget. And we were there November, December 2015. And it was before and after the COP21 document was signed as well. And Cristiano Figueres was marshalling all kinds of governments as well. I just wondered, have things panned out how you thought they would over those period of time? Because we're talking about companies, we're talking about individuals, but we don't have on my panel later on now, uh, and I don't know, but in the audience here, many government re representatives, regulatory representatives as well. So have you had the incentive coming from government and regulation, or has it just been about companies, the private sector, just getting on with it? Well, the things that happen if you, if you rewind to that time of COP21, for me, the big change was that the debate, which was before a political, almost an ideological uh, debate between uh, ONGs, governments, etc., moved into uh, uh, the economic society, so companies and cities. And when you, you think about it, the whole thing about carbon emission will be won or lost in the cities, 80% of the carbon emissions. So whatever the state is saying, whatever the president is saying, if a city wants to be attractive, they have to be good on their emissions. Uh, as you know, I live in China, where well, some, China, some China cities have lost a lot of people because of the pollution, and they're working hard to change that. So the debate on the action has moved from that ideological debate into the practicality of attractiveness, of liveability, of sustainability, and into cities and, and, and companies. And frankly, I think, I see, that the change has been massive in, in uh, the past two years. Regardless of government or because of government? Regardless of government and sometimes because of government, but more so it has been the individual decisions of companies, of institutions, local institutions, local communities. We are speaking about some of them this morning with, with people here, and, and, uh, and, and companies really moving into a new level of efficiency. If you want to be attractive tomorrow, for instance, we do a lot of microgrids with universities in the US. You want to be attractive, you want to attract the best talents, you've got to be green. Mm. And people, whatever the economics, they will move to that, uh, into that direction. I've got one question with you. What is, what is the biggest danger to this project? What is the thing, you mentioned conservatism as well as one of the barriers as well. Is that the one thing that can hold this back now? Or is there something else, as I say, because we're in this, this echo chamber, this bubble with all these people here. Everyone's on the same page here. But a lot of people globally aren't on the same page, and whether it's government, whatever you. So what is the biggest barrier? It's people like me, engineers, making it too complex, right? Actually, digital makes things much more simple for people living with those technologies, but avoiding the trap of developing things which would be too complicated and too complex, 
on our obsession, my obsession is to make sure that everything we develop. You go too far. Sometimes we go too far. I would, I would argue that Schneider is doing the efforts to be different from the industry and to develop for people who use, not only for people who design and engineer. All right, fabulous. Look, thank you very much indeed for your time. Jean-Pascal Tricois, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Wow, we've gone from conservatism to some people going too far as well. I think we've learned something already as well. Right now, a very short 90-second video for you to frame the debate to come as well. And just let me remind uh, everybody as well and everybody out there online, this is going out on Facebook Live as well. So keep your comments coming in. The fourth industrial revolution is evolving at a rapid rate. In fact, artificial intelligence, automation, 3D printing, 5G and the Internet of Things are setting the fastest pace of technological change we've ever known. Digital disruption across every sector is creating a new digital economy and changing our everyday lives. Customer expectations are increasing all the time. The way that we run and manage our lives is becoming totally connected. For companies born in this digital age, there's great opportunity. But for legacy businesses, the question is how to keep up. Companies that can't provide those same levels of service, they fall behind. How can traditional companies harness opportunity to ensure they survive and thrive? And what role does IoT play? One of the areas where Internet of Things has really helped in the industrial space is to be able to predict what's going to happen, what's going to fail, based on past history. In some cases, we'll save just seconds in an assembly process, but in a high volume industry, those seconds can add up to weeks and months of labor that's saved in the process. In an era of increased automation, what are the implications of reskilling our workforce? And how can we meet the increasing energy demands to power this new digital economy? We explore how to harness opportunity and make progress in our constantly evolving connected world. Welcome to the IoT powering the digital economy, harnessing progress, CNBC debate. Fabulous. Right, let me remind you, we are going to break down what are the problems that companies face with aging infrastructure. What are the tools that IoT has that can help solve those issues of that aging infrastructure and what challenges are there in implementing IoT technology. I'm not going to give you long bios of our guests here. You can look them all up. That would take too long as well. But safe to say, we have here Emmanuel Angelides, who is the CEO of Breed Reply. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, sir. Brian Motherway, who is the head of energy efficiency at the IEA, and he hasn't brought on stage with him his great tome about digitalization. I think we can all be thankful about that. Thank you for that, Brian. Uh, we have also Maurice Levy. One or two of you might know who he is. He's the chairman of the supervisory board, of course, over at Publicis, but he's also pioneering tech companies, young tech companies. Publicis 90 is one of his uh, pet projects as well. Delighted to welcome Karen Morgan to the stage as well. She is president and CEO of Dynamic Energy Networks. Uh, and finally, but by no means least, Charlie Ann Arkan, who is the uh, worldwide VP for manufacturing, also the worldwide general manager for manufacturing at Microsoft as well. There are various titles coming from various parts of your organization. Thank you very much indeed, all of you, for joining us today. I'm going to start off with Brian, if I can, as well, because I mentioned this great tome uh, that Fatih Biro and your entire team has been putting together, and it just encapsulates a lot of the issues. So if you can, I don't know, how many pages is it, 200? Usually at least that in any of our reports, Steve. <laughs> so if you can encapsulate that in around about 90 seconds, that would be perfect. Well, I suppose I can encapsulate it in one word, which is change, or maybe two words, change and uncertainty, because I think it's clear to everybody here that the, the potential implications of all of this technology change on all parts of the energy system are potentially profound, from, from how we find energy, how we source it, how we extract it, how we generate it, our networks and grids, to then, of course, how we all use it in, in, in our lives, in our businesses. And, and some of the changes might be, okay, we squeeze a few more percent efficiency out of a network or a system, but I think some of the changes will clearly be much more profound and fundamental than that, than that in terms of enabling brand new business models, brand new ways of doing things in our lives, brand new ways of manufacturing. And it's those kind of step changes that I think 
you know, create both the great opportunities, but also the risks in terms of readiness. Because, you know, who is going to be ready for these changes? Who is going to be left behind? What kind of businesses are already thinking about, not just those that we'll hear from who are developing these technologies, but those that will be affected by them? And energy is, is, is no better example in terms of fundamental disruption to utility models, to the way we do networks and grids. Uh, to the way we use energy in our homes, our mobility, our, our convenience in homes, you know, our daily lives. And then our policymakers ready. We speak to a lot of governments about this issue, and of course they're all, I would say, waking up to the, these changes that are coming, but I can't say that that many are really embracing the fundamental mindset shift that I think could be coming in terms of pace of change. Energy likes to think in terms of decades, reasonable predictability. It likes to think in terms of centralized, broad, system-wide thinking. IoT can disrupt all of that in, in many different ways. And finally, are people ready? Do all of us as individuals know what's coming in terms of issues we have around data, privacy, cybersecurity, but also the changes it will bring to our lives. Will I, in a few years' time, use half as much energy in my home because everything is automated and controlled, or will I use twice as much because I'm so surrounded by gadgets and buttons and screens that everything is consuming electricity? Well, as long as we don't end up with something like Wally, where we're all just sitting there being fed everything by our computers and that. Thank you very much indeed for framing that for us as well. You've actually raised many questions I need to get to, but Karen Morgan, you are President and CEO of Dynamic Energy Networks as well, and we live in a world of acronyms. I mean, how many acronyms we presented with, even at the Schneider Innovation Summit, dare I say, but one acronym that means the most to you, because you represent the money, ROI. It's about the money. Is the money going to find significant ROI actually, in IoT? Actually, it's uh, not ROI, it's IRR. Uh, and the IRR, the shift from a CapEx decision to an OpEx decision, we think is critical in order to enable and accelerate uh, IoT and the digitization of the electricity markets. Uh, and that is actually the role that we play. We're energy infrastructure investors and owners and operators. And we work very closely with Schneider. We are backed by Carlyle, which is a global uh, infrastructure private equity platform. Uh, we coupled ourselves with Schneider because they have a global footprint. And we believe that the integration of the technology and efficient, uh, simple, investor solutions is what will make the difference and push the, uh, push the digital economy forward. Okay. Um, Morris Levy, what's a marketing man like you doing in a place like this? I, I'm asking my, myself, I think, that <laughs> what the hell I'm doing here? <laughs> uh, but, but, I don't but, understand anything about energy, but I understand a little bit about people. And I guess that maybe there is a connection between IoT and people. And the fact that this is disrupting their lives and it is also disrupting a lot of things. Uh, when you, Jean-Pascal was speaking about uh, uh, how companies need to transform themselves. And when you look at the impact on digital, on all companies, we see that every single company on earth will have to transform the way they are operating, the way they are marketing, the way they are communicating, inside the company and outside the company, and also the, the way they are marketing products. So transformation is at the heart of everything. And when it comes to marketing, look at the behavior of the consumers. Everything has changed from the way they are getting information to the way they are shopping. And this is leading to a very different way of communicating to them. Uh, with a whole array of new tools and new approaches. So this is why I'm here, I guess. Julian, Microsoft um, has a problem, which I, I don't know if you really enjoyed my question earlier off camera, but I was saying, Microsoft has a problem. It has every opportunity available. It has enormous free cash flow. It can go wherever it wants in any industry virtually. Why is it putting so much into IoT? Why is that a key part of your investment plans and your growth plans going forward? Um, I'd like to call us a new Microsoft. And so the new Microsoft is, um, is obsessing over customers. And so what we're trying to do is understand the business outcomes, the challenges, and elevate the platform to actually uh, get closer, get more relevant to, uh, to those. And so IoT is, um, 
we kind of use IoT loosely as a, as a disruptive technology. There are many disruptive technologies around it, artificial intelligence, mixed reality, and so on and so forth. We're trying to make it, uh, democratize it, if you will, at a much higher level so that the time to value, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, the, the, probably the, one of the most important things, uh, so they get, they get to value um, uh, e easily and, uh, and get to the business outcomes, deal with the transformation and disruption. Um, what I'd like to uh, point out is um, the number one thing for us. I, I, I agree with Morris when, when you know, we go to people and leadership. There's, not, there's nothing technology won't be able to achieve today, and then we take pride in uh, being able to, um, you know, one of the good, uh, uh, capable providers of, the, um, of disruptive technologies, but leadership and people, and how do we, how do we enable those, and how do we, how do we, um, how do we lead differently um, it, it is key. That, that's the conversation in terms of the challenges. Okay. Fabulous. Um, Emmanuel, you're almost at the opposite end. You're, you're looking at these bright young people who aren't part of the, one of the biggest corporations on this planet, and you're saying to those bright young people, we like your idea, we're going to back it with some early stage capital as well. How is there room for those small players in, in a space which is so dominated by the Schneiders, by the Microsofts, by the, the huge corporations? Because you have to disrupt. Basically, you don't have to be driven by the main priorities that big corporations typically have. So you need uh, you know, a blank field to start with. And uh, what we see every day with these early stage companies that is that there is so much to be done at many different levels. We see so many brilliant ideas, some of them with uh, business models which are absolutely new compared to what we have on the market right now. And most importantly, which are that are sustainable in the long run. And the actions has to happen at different levels thinking about the product that currently we provide the market. Now is looking for something more than the traditional product. It's uh, looking for something which is much more enlarged with additional value-added services. But then if you look also at the way we produce things, again, there's a lot of things to be done in order to be much more effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, the regulatory piece. Regulators are becoming more and more stringent about the requirements in order to be able to deliver services and products to the market with the right quality. And currently, we are not well equipped to be able to meet these kind of requirements. We are not well equipped. That's beautifully laid out for me as well, because the first issue, as I say, we're talking about what are the problems that companies have with aging infrastructure? What are their key issues? Why don't you carry on? Why aren't we well equipped? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, one practical problem is in uh, the ability to maintain or improve the level of efficiency through which they deliver and they develop their solutions. Uh, think about aged, basically, manufacturing lines where there is no ability to predict uh, maintenance required by the equipment that are part of the manufacturing line. The new technologies are enabling this, and so obviously unexpected downtimes down are a big issue for manufacturing lines. Or if you think about, basically, the way to compete as well. Uh, is going to be completely different. Now we are thinking about a competition which is a Me Too competition uh, with the companies with the similar problem, products in the same industries. I think in the future the barriers will be much bigger and uh, basically what will determine the, 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 the size of the, of the competition arena will be the, ec the ecosystem and who are the players providing the services to the customers. Mm -hmm. Just following up on that, in terms of the electricity markets and the evolution of the electricity markets, which I think a few of us have talked about are similar to the evolution of the telecom markets, um, what we're seeing is that existing infrastructure that needs to be upgraded both from the grid side as well as from, call it the industrial uh, and commercial environments. And in so doing, my experience is that there is a gap in understanding that the technology exists and then how do I implement that technology? Because if it's not a core competency of my business, <coughs> it's not part of my manufacturing spend, I typically want to invest in my business. I don't necessarily want to invest in new energy infrastructure. So how do we integrate these technology and capital solutions in order to expedite and educate? Mm -hmm. If I may, one thing that, that I think is important, when we talk about technology, one thing that's happening is the convergence of technologies. We are proud partners of Schneider Electric, and, and 
an important part of this partnership is we're coming from the IT side and they're coming from OT, the operational technologies, and those two technologies converging, actually the, the, the end result or the, the new capability um, is, is at a much higher level. That I think goes to, um, um, is very relevant to what Karen was mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, we come back to the, the old issue that renewables don't work for all industrial customers at the moment. Well, there's a terrific story, and I'm sure you've read the Financial Times this morning. Alphabet has become the biggest corporate renewable energy buyer. They matched, that's the key word, matched their power needs of all their data centers and global operations. But then I read down the article and it says data centers connected to the grid uh, not possible to power them directly entirely from renewable sources as well. We're missing some key parts of the technology if we're having to rely on the old hydrocarbons to power this whole new era, aren't we? We're going through a period of change, but it's the digital technology that's enabling that change. To take your example, the, the Alphabet can now buy enough renewable power to meet all its needs, and the digital solutions are the ones that are matching supply and demand, moving the energy around, and, and balancing all that out. So we don't have to think about this physical link about a, a wind turbine in the garden outside, and is it spinning or not? The point is, at, at the whole system, you can solve that problem using digital control technologies. And we see that, for instance, in a lot of parts of Africa, where they're building off-grid solutions, combining solar, with batteries, with devices, meeting people's needs, bringing great comfort and well-being to them. But it's all only enabled by the digital bit in the middle. So digital is solving those problems as we move from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. And that's why it's such a powerful enabler of the green agenda, of cleaning energy systems, of making them more efficient. It can help bring those new solutions and not just picture the end point, but actually enact the transition. But, but, but. I'm a company, I want to do the right thing, but I know that there's gonna be intermittent supply. Now digital can help me with a smart grid, with the grid edge technologies, all kinds of things, smart sensors, automation. This can all help. I can retrofit my buildings to become more efficient as well. But if I haven't got storage, what use is a lot of this as well? If I can't use renewables a certain amount of the time, or I can't use that wonderful energy source as well, we're missing something, aren't we? So may I? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that's fascinating about what uh, Schneider has done is they've created, and we work very closely with their teams, on microgrid as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, microgrids have lots of definitions. We take kind of a liberal viewpoint there, uh, where you could take a CHP plant, which has been around for quite a long time. You can take a renewable asset. You can take storage. You integrate these things. You layer on the IoT platform, the, ener the energy, the microgrid uh, uh, advisor tool. And the integration of those things are what enable um, resilience, sustainability, reliable power, predictable power over the life cycle of their facilities. It also, in a campus environment, uh, you, know, you can look at the campus being a resilient um, hub in case of a natural disaster or a power outage, like a cybersecurity attack, attack, that campus can also lend to the broader community mm -hmm. and invite that community in. And we work on these models. And they exist today here in France. Uh, they, they exist in Europe, in Western Europe. They exist in the US. But it isn't until recently, because of the advance of technologies and the innovation around financing that those technologies, are we able to actually see this sort of future pivot happening sooner rather than later in certain markets. Maurice, you represent an industry which um, has had to adapt and is still trying to adapt and is still trying to work on a sustainable longer-term business model ba based on the new world and, and the Internet of Things. What, what are the biggest challenges you're finding or, or the publicists has found um, that, have, that have stopped you going more aggressively into Internet of Things or, or harnessing the progress? The biggest challenge that we are facing is people. Uh, limitation of talent, scarcity of talent, and uh, talent which are adapted to this new world. Um, understanding digital is not very complicated. The combination of uh, content, digital, the various platform, the fact that tomorrow we may have to uh, market to a fridge for example, instead of marketing to people, simply because replenishment of the fridge will be based on IoT. So how to tell to the fridge that <laughs> instead of using that brand of yogurt, they should use another brand. 
And uh, getting the right people and the right talent to understand the new world and uh, uh, able to communicate in that new world, being both creative and understanding algorithm, it is one of the biggest challenges that we have. Uh, what will be the war between an idea coming from the brain of an individual and an algorithm who will uh, work and crunch a zillion of data in order to target the right person with which idea to be sure that we are not intrusive and that we are motivating the people to change their mind regarding product. So, our industry is undergoing a huge change, you use the word of change. The transformation we are facing is probably one of the uh, biggest because our industry is only based on people. Yeah. So how to transform their mindset, how to help them adapting to the new world, and that is the biggest challenge I, we have. I want to be in that interview. So you've got a marketing guy, he wants to be there. How do you market to a fridge? And just look at that <laughs> lady or gentleman's <laughs> face as well. Emmanuel, come in on this one as well. So we've moved on to looking at some of the, the bigger issues that, that, that can solve the problems of the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, the point he made is, uh, is absolutely uh, spot on. Because if you think IoT is blending digital and physical, right? And most importantly is uh, uh, enabling a completely new way of competition, new way of developing business models. If you think about the possibility we have right now to gather real-time data for, from the sensors that are spread across our industry or our market, all of a sudden this means that we'll be in a position to have much more information and act on those informations. If you think about a retail shop or a company having a chain of retail shops, all of a sudden, going back to your point about communication, they will be in a position to do specific uh, promotions for the specific individual walking into the shop and potentially being interested to buy something. So this is something absolutely new and this is what uh, means IoT is disruptive. It's gonna change everything. It's not just about technology. But, it, but in my list of statistics, I think I've got one that says, here we go, 99% of data produced is unused, yet to be harnessed. Is a lot of the data just noise? Is it worthless or we just don't know how to use it? Do you, do you want to pick up on that one first? Yeah, we are a manufacturer, and our manufacturing environment uh, actually started with, like, we were using 1% of the data. Data sits in silos. There's no data culture. Decisions are made by habits and behavior, you know. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a data intelligence type. Uh, so well, going back to people and culture. Um, now the, uh, the artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms give us, um, give us the possibility to actually really get intelligent about what you do with it. How do you, we, we talk about change, ground ourselves first in what doesn't change is you have to out innovate your competition. Um, you, have to, um, you have to reach a very different level of operational excellence. You have, the global optimization is now possible. How do you deal with that? And how do you achieve growth, outgrow, outgrow the market? And data is there. There's nothing technology cannot do. For the first time in history, you can uh, grow your top line revenue as well as save costs, magnificent, like 20, 30 percent at both. Um, but, but again, uh, you know, how do you how do you get to the uh, to the levels of change, and uh, and how do you use data for that? Um, we're getting a question coming in on, from Facebook Live on data. We'll come to that in a few moments' time. Karen, you come first. Yeah, so I was just going to say that in uh, in the markets that we focus on, which are not consumer oriented markets, um, uh, they're industrial, commercial, municipalities, government, things of that nature. I think the two things I agree with you, Maurice. I agree with everybody. It's about people. People are usually the I'm problem. I'm something to disagree about, everybody. Uh, well, it makes for okay. a better time. Well, why don't you disagree about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, it, but in our case, it's about education yeah. and thought leadership. So we go into situations where um, we tend not to be prescriptive. We like to listen because of all of the change and transformation that's going on. People really aren't sure what to do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how can we help drive that thought leadership by bringing you know, the best technologies together with the best innovation around how to structure and influence that transformation. Yeah, I, I mean, and I think it's back to the point about how people respond to these technologies. And, and as individuals, and I think as businesses as well, 
the volume of data can be overwhelming and, and it becomes a question of quantity, not quality. And then you see a new layer of emerging of of markets to interpret that data. And you see that in industries and very nice solutions about interpreting very large amounts of sensor data into intelligent decision-making points for manufacturers. And that will happen to us at home as well. We won't want to read massive data files. We'll want an app that tells us you know, it is going to rain or the bus is going to come or whatever else. And then, of course, you put in layers in of trust there because I'm trusting somebody to do that interpretation for me and I'm trusting that I'm getting the right advice. And so it comes back to this, how will people respond to these opportunities? Will they mind that some, a system or a government or a business knowing what type of yogurt they buy and what type of yogurt they're going to buy next Unless week? Unless I don't want the government to know what kind of yogurt I'm buying as well. I mean, by the way, it's the Greek stuff. But, um, but Armin's come in on this one on Facebook, one of our, our, our viewers on Facebook Live, and has asked this question. I wasn't going to go down this way, but I think we should, given everything that's going on in the world, and it's very topical as well. How do you grow this business, the IoT? How do you grow the, the potential? without encroaching upon people's privacy with their data as well. I, I may or may not want the government of the United Kingdom to know which kind of yogurt I have as well, but that should be my decision as well. Did you want to start off on this one as the representative of big corporate tech America? Um, we, we are that, but we are a little different in our data policy and privacy policies. We, um, we never see or touch or monetize, commercialize our customers' data. They're always encrypted, including in compute. Um, and we respect all data sovereignty, so we have more data centers in regions than our competitors combined. We go stand up uh, regions and, uh, you know, where data needs to be and never leave a country, and, you know, we, we kind of respect that too. Um, so um, uh, it, it, it is a big issue, but we, we see ourselves as a good partner in terms of our uh, very enterprise friendly. Data, policy, data privacy policies? In France, we, we are quite lucky because uh, th there has been a law which is, um, uh, I think, uh, from 78, uh, which forced us uh, to look at the files differently and to look at privacy uh, with uh, very strict rules. So it is since uh, 1978 that la Commission Nationale Informatique et Liberté, so the National Commission for Data and Freedom, has been created, and which is looking at how do you compile uh, information, how do you match information, how do you merge information. You have to make declaration uh, at every step, and. Um, uh, it, it took us, it's now 40 years, it, it took us a long while before we have been able to manage uh, those information without uh, being uh, intrusive or be, being uh, 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 touching uh, on, on the privacy of the people. And we learned how to do it. And we discovered something which is relatively easy, that we can certainly uh, use all this data without encroaching privacy. We can. There are a lot of tools, starting obviously uh, with uh, avatars and uh, uh, operation by which you are projecting one model and creating an avatar of a representation of a group of people. And then you can address the information without touching the privacy. So there are a lot of solutions. The easiest one, obviously, to pick an address and to try to get information and to communicate directly. But that is not the best one, and it's not always right. If you want to do the thing right, you have to respect privacy because it is at the basis on which you can build a big business. So I think I wish we all had the policy and the ethics that you're describing and what's nerve-wracking I think as a, as a just a consumer is that not all uh, countries and companies hold to those policies and have those ethics and we're all you know unfortunately aware of that I think that um, again from a from a business standpoint we need to make sure that cybersecurity is a core competency built in to what we're doing. When we're dealing with electricity markets, we can't afford a security breach at a utility 
or inside an organization. Karen, I was just going to go there on cybersecurity. I could ask 100 CIOs, and we do very often at CNBC, the CIOs, the CFOs, the CEOs, what is your biggest concern? And they would, and many of many, many of them will say cybersecurity as well. With digitalization, Brian, I'm opening myself up to only being as good as the security at my counterparty. In our recommendations to government on digitalization, the first thing we always say is develop your own expertise here, because I think sometimes governments are not proactive enough in, in, in thinking out these questions that we've heard uh, examples of in terms of how do we actually get ahead of the curve here in thinking about data ownership, data management, and these very broad issues, very deep issues about security and related matters. So really, governments need to really take this seriously, develop their own way of thinking about it, both in knowledge but also in terms of mindset, opening themselves up to this pace of change, opening themselves up to this really globalized world of these new threats as well as opportunities that are emerging. And I certainly think some governments are moving faster than others, but it, it, it really needs to be a focus for all of us, I think, is, is that, that kind of mutual skilling up around these issues. Emmanuel, um, we are in the phase of this chat where we're talking about the, the key technologies, the most exciting technologies as well. So, I mean, and you're backing these early stage VCs. Have you, have you got one or two areas where you think this is so exciting, this is something that actually uh, I'm, we're moving ahead with, or, or do you not want to share those with us because they're so, too early stage? <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, there are different areas, actually. Uh, one that I think is, is very interesting is uh, everything that has to do with healthcare. If you look around, you can see all governments and uh, local authorities are struggling to provide a much better level of service to the community with a much lower cost. So IoT is going to be disruptive here in the positive way, meaning that uh, will be, uh, thanks to the solutions that are already available and that will be developed over the next few years, we will be in a position to provide a much better level of service to the patients, at the same time uh, provide information that are crucial for GPs and doctors, and at the same time minimize their rehospitalization, that will mean reducing cost. So at the end, it will be uh, uh, basically the entire ecosystem will benefit from these innovations. And at the end, everybody will be happy. We will have the possibility to provide a much better service to the individuals, and at the same time, also reduce costs. So we see a lot of these opportunities, and, uh, and I think this is going to be a a very attractive area over the next few years. Charlie, and I, I've forgotten how many billion you told me that Microsoft is investing in this area, but it's... it's in, in IoT, yeah, we, we just announced, in the last four years, we uh, made uh, investment in the range of like $1.5 billion. This week, we announced $5 billion in the next four years. So it would be crazy of me to say to you which area, which single area as well, but what are the most exciting areas for you? I mean, automation, sensors, grid. I lead manufacturing, and, and, and I think manufacturing is on fire in terms of the disruption and transformation that's happening. Uh, the intelligence supply chains, the, uh, the impact of mixed reality, the, um, the whole um, uh, having full visibility. Mixed reality, we as a manufacturer, AR, Yeah, so... One of the things that we're doing with Schneider, you are, you, you're creating digital twins of not only assets, but, but whole uh, um, production lines or even whole factories. So you can, you, can, you can layer quality data, you can layer production data, uh, and you, you, you just wear a HoloLens device. And then you can also look at predictions and take action. You can interact with robots and change a line or slow down something. It's just a very, very different way of making stuff. And you, you're becoming very, very intelligent. We connected our suppliers. Uh, and so we know before they do, uh, in terms of quality and quantity, in terms of what, what they're going to ship to us right now as we speak. I mean, this is a very, it's a very different, very exciting era to, to be in. We are also investing three to $5 billion uh, in energy infrastructure mostly in and around microgrids uh, and uh, distributed energy resources in these markets that I've mentioned previously. Uh, there's some big gaps though, isn't there? I mean, Dr. Birol and others have talked about the trillions that need to be spent in energy infrastructures to keep at current production levels as well. So where are the gaps? Well, I think on the supply side, it's a question of shifts from where we used to invest money 
to where we need to invest money now. The demand side is very different. There needs to be much more focus on the demand side and much more investment, I think. And I think that's really make or break for the future of energy systems, especially around transition to low carbon and things like that. And the examples we've heard of manufacturing health are two perfect examples of where conversations that may not seem to be about energy turn out to be about energy, because additive manufacturing could fundamentally change energy demand patterns in industry. And even one you know, fairly small example recently, there's some data from the US that since the advent of Netflix and Wi-Fi at home and things like that, people are actually going out less. And it's changing the demand pattern for transport and all of these implications. And so I, I do think if, we were to, if I was to pick one area that needs more attention and more investment, it's around the demand side. Okay, let us move on. Um, we've, we've touched upon this, but I think it is clearly the key issue as well. Um, I asked Sean Pascal about this as well. There was too much conservatism, or in his part, he goes too quickly at times as well. So what are the key challenges to implementation? The, 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 the human side, the technological side as well. We talked about the barriers that still need to be overcome on storage as well. So what are the biggest barriers? Who wants to kick us off? Manu, do you want to kick us off on this one? Why not? So definitely data management is, uh, is the biggest issue uh, because of the amount of data as we touched before, right? And also about the sensitivity of the data. So obviously we, we, we spoke about privacy, but uh, also cybersecurity is a key topic here because given the, the, the increased amount of sensors and the increased amount of connections in data transferred between sensors and entities, obviously there will be a specific area to be addressed. So definitely data management is important. But the other element is, uh, is the machine learning and uh, the artificial intelligence engines being in the position to analyze this data. So a lot of effort has to put to you know, maximize the quality of these engines because then they will turn their outcomes into action. So we have to make sure that the actions are going into the right direction. And then the third one, I think, is, is people, as, as you touched before. People is crucial also because if we look backward over the past, innovation kicked in always faster and faster. And, and in the past, basically, we were used to see a big, you know, uh, technological jump or innovation jump uh, in, in, uh, in basically in a generation time. Now IoT, I think, is going to be disruptive in very few years. So we don't have a generation to learn what to do and how to manage it. So that's going to be a challenge. Then there are some minor, uh, uh, minor issues, uh, I think, uh, uh, linked to the amount of data to be managed, to the fact that the network has to be decentralized, not centralized, to the fact that we need open sources and uh, possibilities to interconnect different items. Brian, in, in terms of the attitude, I mean, digitalization, renewables, hand in hand, it's a brave new world, it's where we're all trying to get to eventually, but let's be honest about this, we need hydrocarbons for the foreseeable future. Again, the work that your organization has done, and BP have done, and OPEC, others as well, it all points to the same scenario until pretty much for all of our lives, around the, hydrocarbons are going to be a very large part of the energy mix as well. Do we need to just get over ourselves and say digitalization can benefit old economies, old industries, old fuel resources, as well as the new? Well, I think digitalization can potentially benefit anything you apply it to. It can make systems more efficient. It can optimize how you extract oil from deep sea, or, you can, or it can fundamentally change how much energy I use in my home, and, and not all the way in between. I do think, as I said, we... we we focus too much on the supply and not enough on demand, because I think that's where the big uncertainties are on the demand side. But I think to your question, Steve, as well, we do sometimes picture the end point and we picture this bright new future where we're all touching screens and, and living very clean and efficient lives, but we, we don't pay enough attention, as you're suggesting, to where we are now and how we take those first steps in change and how do we deal with legacy systems, with stranded assets, with changing people's behavior, with changing regulatory systems. And I think sometimes in this sector, because it's moving so fast and because we can see these great new devices and get excited about them, we, we don't spend enough time thinking about governing how we start that, that, that process of change. If hydrocarbons are demonized too much, are we in danger of not having enough energy to run our data centers, to run our 21st century lives? I think there are underlying realities, and, and I think it is important to recognize that, that right now we are very heavily dependent on conventional fossil fuels, and it was, it's going to take quite some time for that to move. But on the other hand, the pace of change has never been higher in terms of the penetration of renewables, increase of efficiencies, and many new doors are opening up. But yes, there's a lot of transition to, to undergo. 
Boris, I mean, you, 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 you nailed one of the key points here. It's about people. It's about reskilling. It's about training them to talk to fridges um, and learn <laughs> algorithms and be a marketing man as well. Is that, is that the big implementation challenge you see or, or something else as well? I think that one of the biggest challenges that we have uh, to face is uh, how to uh, eliminate the fear that people have uh, regarding the future. There are a lot of people, but they are a minority, who love the future, who love the adventure of the future, and are ready to learn and to adapt themselves. And there is uh, the vast majority of the people who are a little bit conservative, uh, as one philosopher said, uh, uh, people are animals of habitude, of habits. And when you change the habit, there is a resistance of the people because they are resisting to change because they are fearing that they will not recognize uh, the new world and how to fit in that new world. So uh, the importance of communication and helping the people to adapt, what will be the future of work? in a world where artificial intelligence is, is there. So everyone is seeing the fun and uh, everything which is coming, which is uh, helping. And at the same time, you see in most of our clients, the vast majority of the people are frightened. What will happen? What will happen on the roads when all the cars will be driverless? Uh, what will happen in our lives, etc.? So there is... Uh, a, an enormous task of helping the people to understand the new world and helping them to manage their own life in this new world and to adapt themselves to this new world. And education that you mentioned is key. Uh, and uh, we, we need to put a lot of money behind education because the only way to adapt the people to the future is to help them understanding it and to be adapted to it. To take care of our grandchildren, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, I wanted so to speak about my grandchildren. Well, see, I, would do I it. brought it up. <laughs> so the, uh, in, the, in the university environments, we have uh, one situation where we're working with an institute within the university to bring uh, undergraduate and graduate programs into the education and the thought leadership around the transformation of these energy markets. And so I think, you know, it's, it's it takes a while to get there, but when we're starting uh, really with the young people to, to, to inform them, to bring in their thought leadership, and to execute around actual living labs, much like you know, we do here in the labs in, in uh, your company and here in Schneider, uh, we think those are critical, critical elements. Salam, final word on this. Um, on challenges, one of the things uh, that, that everybody's trying to figure out, uh, including IoT, is how much computing and data handling do you do at the edge, and how much do you do in the cloud? We, um, that, is a, that is a big um, thing that everybody's trying to figure out. I'll use connected vehicle as an example. A car, a connected car, uh, generates like terabytes of data every hour, uh, and so, uh, and, and then that, that car, if it's autonomous, driving itself uh, has to brake without going to the cloud and asking, you know, if there's a deer, do I stop or not? And so, so that, that is a, that is a uh, dramatic example, but, but that applies to manufacturing, that applies to energy, and then uh, the, uh, a big part of our investment is, uh, is going to that. And, and, and final, uh, more on the behavior, we are coming from a silo, deep technology, hundreds of millions of dollars, five, you know, years of implementation, et cetera. Now this IoT or this the, the new world, digital world, fast cycles. We, we like to say think big, start small, go fast. So weekly cycles, start from the outcome, find your data, uh, get, fail fast or learn fast, get to the next one, get to the next one. That is, that is the kind of behavior, leadership behavior that has to be there uh, to get to the results quickly. Fabulous. Um, look, I'd like to thank you all very much. I just want to, just my th final thought on this as well. I, I thought it was very interesting. So many issues, whether it was about automa automation, sensors, smart grids, uh, the energy capacity for data centers, what have you, uh, privacy, all these kind of issues, cybersecurity came up. But one thing that came through to me is actually it's a very personal issue. It's about people, it's about habits, it's about conservatism, or it's about going too fast as well. Uh, and, and I thought that was really interesting as well, that actually it came back down to people and something which is so technologically advanced and so exciting. 
society going forward, people became the key issue. Uh, and, of course, education of people being uh, perhaps at paramount of that as well. So I'd like to thank our fantastic panel. Um, let's start off with Manuel Alangelides. I'd like to thank Brian Motherway. I'd like to thank Moles Levy, of course. And I'd like to thank Karen Morgan and Charlie and Arkan as well. Thank you very much, all of you. Before you clap, um, I'm going to uh, say that Jean-Pascal Tricoy is going to come to the stage for a couple of final thoughts, I believe. Uh, but anyway, why don't we give the uh, panel a round of applause anyway? So, well, I would like to thank the panel on such a diversity of opinion and origins on, on, the, on, on the same topics. Uh, well, very sensitive to the human touch on the leadership, right? At the end of the day, we are facing a huge revolution, and revolution is about daring to lead that revolution, making the decision and leading the way. So what we need to do here is to make sure that people are bored of that transition and revolution. But thank you all. Thank you, Thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you.